So very good. Uh, wonderful to see you all. It does seem odd. I feel like we should start in prayer, but we've been starting in prayer, and this is kind of just the next step. So um, actually, there's a lot today and a lot of things that are kind of some more of a, a business or technical things. Uh, so um, for those, I know I'd mentioned because I believe it was yesterday was the feast day of St. Simon Stock in the Carmelite calendar, but we're not going to talk about Simon Stock too much today. Uh, I discovered something during the week that kind of takes precedence, at least uh, this weekend. Uh, had a was able to finally touch base and have a good conversation with uh, my good friend. Uh, he was my pre-novice director, Brother Daryl. Uh, he is the one, he's in D.C. right now, is the uh, chair of Carmelite Studies at Catholic University of America. And if some of you may have may recall, after I visited out there last fall, he was talking about wanting to start a lay association of Carmelites. Something that he came, he was thinking about this, not knowing what we're doing, and I was hopeful to come up with something more formal, not knowing what he was doing. God always so often works this way, and I, I, I appreciate that those little bolsters of encouragement, like, okay, yes, you're on the right path, and, and my blessing, my um, graces are with you. So I got, we got to have a conversation finally, um, and he, uh, a couple things from that is, he is going to Rome in September to meet with the general provincial and is hoping to present to him some outlines, some ideas about forming the lay association. Because to have a lay association, it would, it's not just something we can do and say, and oh, we're lay associates. It's actually an association with the order, form a relationship, so it would eventually need Rome's, the Carmelites and Rome's approval and formalization to do this. So um, that's going to be coming in September. As we get closer, I may ask of you all to pray novenas, a novena to Our Lady of Mount Carmel um, for that, and we'll give him more information. Uh, there's not much for us to do aside from pray and then for me to share with them what we have been doing um, on that. Uh, also with that is we're going to move forward with a scapular metal. We're having someone that's going to reproduce a, a, an older version that is very beautiful and been part of the community. So one of the things we're talking about is like with this lay association for those who take make the promises or however we phrase that would receive this medal. So we're we're kind of strengthening those bonds with the community with the order and support and richness. Uh, he also reminded me in that conversation, and I had a moment of great humility. Um, someone else may be smarter than I here. Does anybody know what tomorrow is? <laughs> it is, tomorrow, yes, is Sunday. And the fifth Sunday of Easter. Okay, so, so uh, the canonizations in Rome. There are ten, ten saints being canonized. Uh, among them is, the, the more well-known is Charles de Foucault, but the other is finally Blessed Titus Bransma, our good Carmelite from the Netherlands, is um, being canonized. So I'm going to talk a little bit about him uh, this morning. That's why we're kind of moving Simon Stock in the background um, on that. Also, uh, today, uh, I this was a personal intention for me during the Mass, but there is, so uh, Brother Mike Joyce with the Oak Arms is being ordained to the priesthood pretty much as we are speaking right now um, for, for the order. So praying for him and, and the community and the blessings upon his ministry. Uh, I wanted to also give just a touch a little base, and I had this written before we received our Infinite Prague prayer cards, so another little encouragement, I think. Uh, on the Infinite Prague statue, um, 
Unfortunately, when I, I reached out and talked to the lady who was making the vestments for him, uh, she did not receive my email. And it took me a few weeks to follow up. And I followed up and finally found out that she had, and, and I made a mistake, a typo, um, in, in her email address on that. But that is getting started. Um, she's got the plans, and she's going to be looking at getting that going. I have a hope that it will be ready for July when we gather on our the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Um, that one, just to give you a heads up, we will have a potluck that day. So to have a meal, kind of like we did for St. Joseph, was very good, and I think for Our Lady of Mount Carmel also. So two months away, but just be planning ahead for, for greater festivities on that. Um, so with the, and the infant of Prague, just to, to mention, someone had asked me what the connection is. Is there a connection to Carmel and why, you know, why, why have an infant of Prague for the Carmelite group and not Our Lady of Mount Carmel? And, and the reason for that primary reason is Teresa of Avila had a great devotion to the infant Jesus. And her devotion is given a lot of the credit for the rise in devotion to the infant of Prague. Okay. So his presence is still very seen widely throughout Carmelite houses and in parishes. Uh, and, and he has given graces in watching over the community, especially the discalced and those who came off from, from Teresa's reforms. Um, so that's kind of the connection and, and why the choice and the decision. Um, and along with him, uh, with the vestments are, that are being made, uh, we have someone who is going to craft, special craft, a wooden case. Some have seen previous work of his that is very good. This one, he's kind of taking it a step up. I, we were talking this week about it, so I'm containing my excitement here. The, the ideas we came up and that he can do is we're going to make it, design it so it's like a little shrine. So the doors will open with Carmelite images in there and we'll have our infant of Prague for us. So a lot of things, maybe pray to him. If it's July, that would be great, but we give our Lord the time. Before I forget two uh, last things, because I will forget them if I don't say them now, our next meeting, uh, June 18th, will be Saturday, June 18th. Um, and I guess I have three things. I'm already starting to forget. Um, the one I almost forgot, I sent in the email, and one of the sheets you have are a list of some of the Carmelite communities. This is not a comprehensive list. These are the ones um, that at this time I was looking at to give that we could offer some financial support for. Uh, the one, so the baskets on the table by the handouts. Uh, so today, what we're, we're collecting for and we'll send to is for the Carmelite Hermits of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Lake Elmo, Minnesota. Uh, particularly, they are in the stages of building a public chapel. Uh, so the funds will go specifically to assist with their, their public chapel that they're building there. Um, and if you're just to give you an idea, I appreciate your all's gratitude for the daughters of St. Elias. Uh, I sent them a check for just under $200 from your all's generosity. And by that, I mean it was $1 under <laughs> on that. <laughs> so. The last note, um, the Traveling Fatima statue is in the area this month. Uh, so you can check it um, if you need to look up the schedule at FatimaTourForPeace.com. Uh, on the 15th, which is tomorrow, she will be at Christ the King, just down the road. And then on Monday at St. Robert Bellarmine. Beginning on the 19th, which I think is Thursday. Um, so she moves over to Kansas. She's going into the hinterlands. Um, she'll be at St. Michael the Archangel. Then on Friday the 20th, Queen of the Holy Rosary. Next Saturday, Holy Trinity. And on the 25th, 
She will be at the Cathedral of St. Peter. Okay, so I mentioned lots of stuff. I thought we got through that. So now the good stuff, the, the spiritual life. Uh, Titus Bransma was uh, born in 1881, and there's just a brief sheet. We don't have a large collection uh, of his works. Um, primarily, he was a journalist, so primarily his works were in articles, and I have not seen a collection of those articles. Uh, this is one that the Carmelite Press out of near Chicago put together of what is currently some historical biographical information in some of his spiritual writings. Uh, the main thing and what he gave witness to was being in the Netherlands in the time of World War I, World War II, was no surprise standing up to the fascism and particularly against the Nazis and was a very strong voice in encouraging the newspapers as the Nazis were trying to come in politically. They, of course, were forcing pressure on the media to publish their propaganda, their ideologies, under great consequence. And Titus Bransma stood firm and went around encouraging newspapers and journals to refuse to pr print their material. I think we can hear echoes of some work like that would be good today for different things, okay, different fight. But he stood up, and after about he after he had convinced around ten or eleven publications, the Nazis arrested him. Quick, okay. During his interrogation, his accuser asked him, requested that he put down write down what the Carmelite and Catholic objections were to Nazism. He put those down. I have not read that. I don't know if a translated copy exists or if surviving copies exist. They quickly took that as his confession, sent him to Dachau. Within a month, he was executed by lethal injection. He is a man who very clearly died as a martyr for his faith on that. Okay. I included there a prayer, popular prayer that he wrote um, that can be offered particularly before a picture of Christ from Titus Bransma to honor him. So I strongly encourage you at some point tomorrow as an act of gratitude and to honor and for whatever his intercessions and prayers are in front of a picture of Christ, either at home or at church, to offer this prayer for him. What I wanted to talk briefly, and this will be one of those days where even though the written material is a bit longer, is I'm not going to cover very much of it, just the general ideas. If you want to go in depth to, to read it and more, I, I do want to draw out and remind the first, there's a difference in the first piece. Um, and, and this is like this for, for all the chapters that we look at. Is And it's the one that doesn't have a picture, so I could point it out, that has the quote of the chapter of the rule. And the reflection after that uh, is geared toward, was actually, I wrote it while I was in the novitiate, for the members of the community. So you can tell there's a different voice there. And I wanted, and I and I thought and prayed about: Do I go ahead and include those because um, it really does address those living in the community and the questions, the challenges that the men and women of the communities are facing, which obviously is not us. You know, very different environment, situation. And I prayed about it and thought, no, it's worthwhile going and sharing. Because I do bring out different perspectives in different ways. And I think one of the things, too, is that just as we are struggling and questioning to live you know, a life that, has, that originated 900 years ago, maybe 1,000, depending on whose history we look at, in this modern world, in this modern context, and that it really does still have value and 
it's not something to just push aside. But I think it will give some other ways of thinking about it to you. Um, but as we seek to adapt it more clearly to life outside of the order and family life, this fifth chapter says that if the prior and brothers see fit, you may have foundations in solitary places or where you are given a site that is suitable and convenient for the observance proper to your order. And this chapter came from a mitigation by Pope Innocent III. So it was not part of the original rule of St. Albert. And the reason for it is, going back to our history of the Carmelites being on Mount Carmel, place was not an issue, question, that's where it was. But when Suel Adin came in and in response to the Crusades, destroyed, took out the community, the community fled. Okay, And where they went to primarily was to Europe. So this was a community that was displaced. It was as though God was saying, you who have gathered on Mount Carmel to come in quiet and solitude around the fount of Elijah to perfect yourself and become brothers of the Blessed Virgin Mary, now I am sending you out into the world, out of your cave. Not that that was a bad place. You had your time. And now I need you to go forth to share your treasures with the world. And when they went into Europe, they, the principal way that they were deciding on where to have a foundation is wealthy people would say, can you have a community here and build them a chapel and a house? And sometimes it was good. But sometimes it was in not good places. Or you can imagine if these are people wealthy enough to build a chapel and a home for a religious community, sometimes they weren't the greatest people with the greatest motivations and intentions. Okay. And being in the city, if you're going in those cities, even in those times, how are you going to find a life conducive to, to quietude and silence in that? So I said, be attentive. Be attentive to the places where you build your foundations okay. so that you can have a site, place that is suitable and convenient for the observance. And I think that's a key. He's saying so that you can observe and keep your way of life where you live at makes a big difference and is going to affect it. Okay. And how I think that helps us and leads us is in that same way to accept places that are suitable and convenient to the observance of our Christian faith and way of life and a life in allegiance to Christ. And to think again in terms of not just physical location places because most of us don't have a lot of choice or most people don't have a choice. Growing up in the back of the yard Chicago not a place convenient for a Christian life at all. But you're going to live there because that's where you live and you don't have the options. So one is, yes, if you have an option of moving, of where to live, be attentive. How it may affect your relationships with your family, whether you're, I mean, and each community is going to have its challenges and effects. So those I leave for the written word on that. Because what I want to open up more is to think of the ways that it is not just about places, but also where you live, think of the condition of your home inside, of the care, of the furnishings you have, of the objects, of the decorations. We live in a time where decorations, a lot of our Carmelite brothers in the novitiate really enjoyed watching the home fixer-up shows. And the thing that always just, many things bothered me about it. I, will, I should honestly say, yes, there are some really neat things too. But one of the things that struck me the most was they never did a sit down to say, what kind of decor is important to you? Are there any pictures meaningful to you?
that those people have their home remodeled and all of their former pictures, unless someone specifically said occasionally, well, I want picture this area for family pictures, all of their pictures were chosen by the designers because it fit the fashion, it fit the decor, rather than, you know, okay, image of Christ, image of Mary, a crucifix. Someone, since our last meeting, asked me about, thinking about crucifixes, Father, what's, what's a Carmelite crucifix? The Franciscans have two. They're greedy. No, they're not greedy. <laughs> no one accuses the Franciscans of being greedy. Um, I'm glad I got a smile, Tom. <laughs> they have the Tau and the St. Damiano cross because of its connection with St. Francis himself. Carmel, we don't really have a crucifix. But what we have is Our Lady of Mount Carmel and a statue and images of Our Lady of Mount Carmel from our roots. So having an image of Our Lady of Mount Carmel in the home. Or what posters do kids put up in our room? Or even as adult kids, okay? LeBron James, Michael Jordan, Titus Brandsmith, St. Simon Stock, Teresa, the saints, the images. How we lay out our home is my, my mom's husband open floor plan TV on the wall the only places you can go where you're not hearing the TV is their bedroom or my mom's office okay needless to say it commands the home okay also your job Having a job that is conducive to your way of life as a Christian. And we're seeing this more and more in recent years, that there are some professions that once were some of the, the greatest, most virtuous, and we'd still say being a teacher is one of the most virtuous professions. But many public schools are instituting directives that you about what pronouns and names you are allowed to to use for children. And if you find yourself in a position where your job is requiring you to do something that is antithetical to Christ, if you find, I think I've shared with you all my job, one of my jobs shortly out of high school at a hotel overcharging room rates, antithetical to Christ, you know. So be considering if you in your jobs or any place you volunteer or work, choose one that is. In the beginning early church a gave a list, and I'll leave you to read what that some of that list is about jobs that if you were a Christian in the community, you could not have these jobs. They understood because to do so required you to turn your back on Christ at times. That excuse we love, well, I'm just doing my job. Survivor, it's just a game, does not apply because we're not looking at culpability, the effects. That's what Innocent and the Provincial, the Carmelites saw. Where you live, where you work, your, your hobbies, your interests, the things we do for fun, our friends, have effects on us. So be attentive to those and choose things that do not drive Christ out of your heart, even if it's just for a moment. I notice we're 10, so the only other thing that I wanted to say, and this probably does not need much further explanation, is what this, this chapter points out for us, the need for solitude. It is a fundamental need for our humanity and relationship with God, regardless of your station in life, regardless of your situation. And it may be hard, especially young parents. It may be hard to find any time, but find five minutes. Or that time, maybe it's just you and the baby, those few moments he, the baby's sleeping, okay, that's the time for rosary and prayer with God. Um, but to find that quiet and that solitude, because that is where we come closest to God. That significance. Have some each day. Even if it's just five in the morning, five in the evening. It's, a, it's an essential part.
uh, take time just for a couple of questions, and then of course converse afterward if anybody had. Okay, I'm finally starting. Oh, my, my question would be, um, and, and the solitude place probably has something like this, but it's so difficult to be in silence. Yes. How do we practice that? Better? Start off small. Okay. Start off with you. You want a time that's not easy, but that pushes a little bit. Um, so one is, you know. If you haven't practiced it, start off with five minutes, truly. Or for kids, get them in the practice of when they when you all sit down around the supper table, don't immediately start the prayer. Wait 10 seconds. Okay, even those little times. And, and what Teresa, and this gets into contemplative prayer and how to lead ourselves into that, is have something, use scripture to meditate to guide your thoughts because a lot of times it's distracting thoughts and I just I need to direct it somewhere so we use those as a point of focus something that's divine and holy she often used the the passion of our Lord to, to meditate on you know yeah Mm -hmm. um, so is there a particular beauty or importance to silence, like not the liturgy of hours, not scripture, not just through the Yeah. Silence? Good observation. Yeah. Yeah. Difference between silence and solitude. Um, and, and they're both needed. Sometimes simultaneously, sometimes not. Okay. So solitude, even working out in the garden, just you and God doing the work of your hands. In that. So having that solitude. The silence um, comes into, that's what opens up for us the prayer of, of quiet, of contemplation. So to have, and that is a gift, and we'll talk maybe sometime, it's worth just talking about the prayer of quiet um, more in depth, is it is a gift from God. So what we do is we quiet the heart, quiet our physical being, maybe focus on scripture, and then by God's grace at different times, he comes to the soul and suspends the faculties so we can truly enter into the silence. You know, not just physical sounds, but even to silence and quiet our thoughts and, and be in his presence. Uh, so I'd say silence is also a necessary thing. So at times to do prayers, if you're doing a prayer interiorly, reading your prayers, you're still creating that silence on a level. Okay. Let's, yeah, I think let us close with, with a prayer. And, uh, well, why, why not? We, Titus gave us a prayer, so, and I printed it off, so might as well you use that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O oh Jesus, when I look on you, my love for you starts anew and tells me that your heart loves me and you my special friend would be. More courage I will need for sure, but any pain I will endure, because it makes me like you and leads unto your kingdom too. In sorrow do I find my bliss, for sorrow now no more is this, rather the path that must be trod that makes me one with you, my God. O oh, leave me here alone and still, and all around the cold and chill. To enter here I will have none, I weary not when I am alone. For Jesus, you are at my side, never so close did we abide. Stay with me, Jesus, my delight, your presence near makes all things right. The Lord be with you, and may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.